Good morning. I'm here with a brief announcement from the progression team. Sorry, I had the wrong paper. Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. You have prayed, Brick Lane family, and God has been answering. The progression team, who consists of John Mounts, Rick Renninger, Keith DeWalt, Merle Stoltzfus, Mike Rudolph, and myself, have met five times. In fact, I can honestly say that a day hasn't gone by without an email, a text, certainly prayer. We each have a specific prayer team praying for us. And of course, the faithful Brick Lane body encouraging and praying as well. In fact, just this morning, I got a Sandy Eichema hug. If you've ever gotten a Sandy Eichema hug, you know what I'm talking about. Where she told me, Mike, we're praying for your progression team and for the succession process. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. God has shown himself almost tangibly in giving us unity to move forward as we work to ensure a God-honoring succession for our senior pastor. We meet again this coming Wednesday. Please continue to pray for this process. Thank you for your encouragement. Good morning, church family. Uh, I want to welcome anyone who's here, maybe with a family member on a holiday weekend or just because you found us online that may or may not be a visitor uh, or, or newer to this church. Welcome. We are so glad to have you here worshiping with us. I hope you were warmly greeted before the service and will be so after as well. Let's transition our hearts and minds now to worship our God and Father in heaven uh, through song. Uh, you can remain seated. Uh, sing with us, Speak, O Lord.
As Christians, the message we celebrate each week in our worship service is the gospel. The good news message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and that redemption story applied to our lives. This is a message that has not only changed the personal lives and, and outcomes of many in this church, but has changed the course of history for all creation. If you had to guess what synonym Jesus most often paired with the gospel, what would that be? Maybe the gospel of grace, uh, the, the gospel of redemption, the gospel of salvation. In his own words, Jesus said he came to this world to bring the gospel of the kingdom. What does the kingdom of God look like? Here Christ himself proclaim what the kingdom of God is like from the mouths of some of our first through fourth graders. So what is the kingdom of God like? It's a little mysterious, is it not? Jesus described it like a flower whose roots grow before the flower sprouts. It grows in the hearts and consciences of man. And Jesus has come to establish this kingdom, both over all earthly powers and in the hearts of man. Would you stand and sing with us now number 441?
Jesus, we give praise and honor to your name, our great King and God. Your greatness is unsearchable. The gifts which we experience daily declare your abundant goodness. The sweetness of a fresh strawberry. That feeling of crispness in the air after the break of a storm. The lingering joy after a good laugh. These springs of life speak of your grace and your mercy. You open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. And despite the mar that sin has put on your creation, your mercy is over all that you have made. Your kingdom indeed spre spreads from shore to shore. The kingdom of heaven is yours, and you promise to be near to all who call on you. And so, Lord, we ask, preserve us, your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Jesus came to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. But why did Christ have to come to establish this kingdom? Couldn't he just have done it from heaven? You see, the world has fallen into the wrong hands. The kingdom of this world is, as Paul put it, in the embrace of the evil one. Jesus reminds us in this passage that we cannot serve two masters. But haven't you tried to serve two masters this week? We are so often like Israel who, right when they leave Egypt, long for the comforts of their former slave master, at the sake of the kingdom that is in front of them. So, in which kingdom are you laying up treasures? The kingdom of this world or the kingdom of heaven? Take time now and silently confess of your sin.
Heavenly Father, without Christ, we, along with all creation, are stuck in the bondage of corruption. Please, Lord, overthrow the idols we set in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stay seated as we sing together? Now we look to our assurance of pardon, a fitting word, a much more kingdom-like word than forgiveness, is it not? Pardon. In your strength, sinner, you would be stuck in the corrupt and rotting cell of the kingdom of this world. But praise be to God, Jesus did come. And he has established the kingdom of God, not through power, but through grace. From the Gospel of Matthew again, and Jesus said to his disciples, 
Truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Even the pardoning of your sin. Faithful Christian. Let's sing together. The next song we're going to sing is number 345 in the hymnal, if you're interested in grabbing one. This song is written first to one another and then to Christ. Okay, that most of our songs are to Christ and then to one another. This song is written to one another, O members of the kingdom of God, and then to Christ. Sing as much church family.
flip with me to the back of your hymnal. We're going to page number, should have looked this up beforehand. Psalm 93 is what we're going to recite together. If you can beat me there. Page 818, thank you. This was our call to worship last week, and I just thought it was very fitting with our service. Page 818, Psalm 93. I will read the regular type if you could respond with the bold type. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Your statutes stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O Lord. Amen. Good morning. Sometimes when somebody comes to the front to lead in prayer, it's easy to disengage. And yet the things that we are going to bring before our Father this morning are so important. So could I ask each one of us to actively talk to God with me as I lead us? Let's pray. What a privilege it is to talk to you, our Father, you who are gracious and sovereign the God who keeps his promises and whose purposes always prevail, who loved us before the foundation of the world, who called us and cleansed us and who causes us to grow and who ordains everything for our good and for your glory. Father, you are the God who gave faith to Abraham, who gave courage to Moses and victory to David, who used Elijah to humiliate the idols of the nations and to showcase your power. God, thank you for using ordinary people in extraordinary ways in your kingdom. Thank you that Jesus called fishermen and tax collectors to be disciples. Thank you for choosing the lowly things, the despised things of this world to display the beauty of your gospel and for working through your church in ways that are certainly not glamorous to this world, but in ways that have eternal weight and significance. God, thank you for how you have worked in this church, for the faithful pastors you've given us through the decades. And as we look ahead to a time of transition, we do pray that you would guide the progression team, and we ask that you would give us leaders who will pick up the mantle of godly shepherding, of humble and wise leadership. Father, you say that when we ask according to your will that you hear us, and so we stand now on that promise as we pray for various groups of people within this church. God, I pray for fathers and for husbands that they would lead their families with purpose and with perseverance. Would you give them the energy to love and to understand their wives and to teach their children with creativity? God, don't let us grow lazy in discipline because you tell us that a good father disciplines the son whom he loves. Would the wives and the mothers in this body embrace their roles with diligence and with joy God, they need strength to serve in humility and to disregard the message of our culture that criticizes biblical marriage and biblical motherhood. So would you help our women in this way? God, would they prize inward beauty 
and would they feel your pleasure on them as they do? Would your spirit give our children the desire to honor their parents? Shield them from sinful thoughts and from selfish motives. God, surround them with friends and mentors to be spiritual guardrails for them. Would they seek obedience and contentment? May they learn to read their Bible and to pray with you at a young age. Our teenagers, Father, need maturity to fight against the seductions of this world, to focus on what is admirable and pure. God, would you help them to filter all their thoughts through the Bible so that in their school or their work or their relationships, they might not only know what is right, but seek to do what is right. God, help our single adults to know your love for them. May they be sought out here and cherished and included in the life of this church. Give them joy in their work. Protect them from the ways in which the evil one would seek to derail them. Help grandparents, God, and great-grandparents to pursue faithfulness in their calling and give them great hope for the life to come. God, this morning, I want to pray particularly for those here with unfulfilled desires, those who are longing for a spouse or a child, a job, a home, those who have pleaded for healing from chronic sickness or for the salvation of a family member. God, in their void and in their waiting, give them the grace to pursue godliness and to believe the words that we heard earlier, the words of Jesus when he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Good Father, because you love to bless your children, give these quiet sufferers in our body the desires of their hearts. And would you bring honor to your name as the God who hears and who answers our prayers, just like you heard Elijah when he cried out to you. Father, we're grateful for so many new faces that you're bringing to us. Would you make us members welcoming to them and warm? Would the most introverted among us seek out newcomers and engage them? And give these new people good friendships, God, deep friendships here. And would many of them join in the life of this church and become members and use their gifts for the good of this body? Father, we also pray for more people in this community to know your son. Along with fellow brothers and sisters, would you bring the lost through these doors where they might meet you and join your heavenly family? And God, there are your people in parts of the world who are enduring trials that we cannot even imagine. And so we pray for the Christian church in Rwanda and in Nigeria, in places like China and Israel and Ukraine. God, you have granted these people not just faith to believe in you, but you've also asked them to suffer for your name. And so we pray on their behalf and ask for peace beyond understanding. We ask for patient endurance for these people. May tyrannical governments not crush their faith. May the stress of political turmoil not cause them to throw in the towel. May war and poverty not prevail. May the devil himself and the very gates of hell not prevail against these saints. Instead, Father, continue to build your global church and may your kingdom come in these parts of the world. You also urge us, Father, to pray for those in authority. And so we think of the leaders of our country, of our state, of our counties and townships and boroughs. God, would you grant these men and women the wisdom to make decisions that will further your purposes and that will enable us to live lives of peace. And we are especially grateful for those in these positions that serve you as their king. Thank you for placing them there. God, I, I could continue all morning asking for things, and I'm so aware of how many things we've already asked you for this morning, and so I am so grateful that you are not like us, us frail human beings 
so easily overwhelmed by the pressures of this life. Oh God, thank you for your great compassion towards us, for new mercy each morning, and for effortlessly shouldering the weight of all these requests that we bring before you. God, we are astounded that you take the light in us because of Christ, and we're grateful. And so now, as we hear your word, God, change us and renew us. Give our pastor grace to preach in faith and in boldness. And would you be glorified now in our dependence on you? And would you hear our prayers, not because we deserve that, but because we pray them in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Amen. Would you stand and sing one last time, number 734. The story is told of a European museum that housed priceless artifacts. And one day, people who were visiting heard a crash and a breaking in another room, and they all ran into it. And there was a woman who had gotten a little bit too close to a priceless Ming Dynasty vase, doubtless a vase. And she said, as people gathered around, it's OK, it's OK, I'm not hurt. Uh, that's just how some people uh, th think about it. Um, I would imagine that if most of us were given a priceless Ming vase and told you could put flowers in it, we would decline because we would just know we'd drop it sometime or one of our kids would run it over or we would ruin it. That's a little bit how I feel about this passage today from 1 Kings chapter 18. It, it is a priceless passage. It is so beyond my ability to speak to it. I feel it deeply. I've felt it all week. But this is where we've come in this marvelous chapter of 1 Kings 18. And so, could we read it? This follows the contest on Mount Carmel in Israel, which country had worshipped Baal now for many years because of the wickedness of their king Ahab, who had married a foreign princess named Jezebel, who had introduced her false religion of the worship of the idol Baal and substituted it in Israel for the worship of Jehovah. She had killed the Lord's prophets, and she was prosecuting anybody that she could who was aligned with Jehovah, the true God. And so Elijah had told the prophets of Baal to come, King Ahab to come, and representatives from the entire ten tribes of Israel. They had come all day long, the prophets of Baal, having built an altar and put meat on it, asked Baal to come down and send fire. They danced and cut themselves, no fire from heaven. At the end of the day, Elijah prayed his simple but fervent prayer. To the one God of the universe, fire from heaven came down and burned not only the sacrifice, but the wood, the stones of the altar, the dirt underneath it, and all the water that had been poured over it. The people prostrated themselves. And so we come now after all that great thing took place, and the 400 prophets of Baal had been dragged down to the bottom of Mount Carmel and slaughtered because God had commanded such to be done if anybody causes others to worship idols in Israel. And we come now to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41, after that amazing contest. Now Elijah said to King Ahab, Go, 
eat and drink, for there's the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. You will recall there had been three and a half years of famine with not a drop of rain. There's nothing, the boy said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. And the seventh time, the servant responded, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell King Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. <clears throat> and the power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. <clears throat> it is late in the day. The sun is setting in Israel, and thousands of people are dispersing from a day they will remember all their lives in all directions. 400 of them lie dead. The prophets of Baal, whom God through Elijah had commanded be killed for their leading the entire nation astray. And so their white clerical robes are stained red with their own blood, and they will need to be buried to keep the disease from spreading. Well over a thousand other people are there too, People gather that because when 400 prophets of Baal were unwillingly dragged down from the summit of Carmel to the bottom to be slain, you figure at least two people per man, if not three, to drag them there. Royal guards, royal guards are there, courtiers from the palace in Samaria, representatives from the 10 tribes, a sufficient number of people to make all this happen. So that morning, that whole crowd, except for the prophets, rose from their beds as worshipers of Baal. That afternoon, they prostrate themselves, face down on the ground, and say, Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. But the focus now in our passage is on two men. One, Elijah, who has been all the way through the chapter, and one on a man who has not been in the chapter for 21 verses, the king of Israel, Ahab the one who married Jezebel and through her led all of Israel into the worship of a false god, leading them into eternal hell. So here is Ahab the king. Here is the tough prophet Elijah covered with camel skin cloak. Now it's interesting to me that the books of First and Second Kings, which were originally written as a single book, was broken up in our English Bibles. The book of First and Second Kings covers 400 years of Israel's history. Imagine now you were going to write a history of America beginning in 1776. How many things would you feel the need to say to arrive at 2024? And yet, of the few things that can be said in these two books about the entire history of Israel, God thought it important to include a detail in verse 41 where Elijah says, go eat and drink. For I hear the sound of heavy rain, because the famine is over. Now we get Elijah saying, I hear the sound of heavy rain. It had not started to rain yet, of course. But in his faith-filled imagination, it's as if he can hear it coming, because God has promised it. But why does the Bible go out of its way to say that Elijah said, go eat and drink? The simple answer, it seems to me, is that it's appropriate to celebrate, of course. The drought is over, it, it, it makes sense. The uh, hunger and thirst of the drought would be um, overcome sort of symbolically by the eating and drinking. It makes the drought seem like a thing of the past. But there's a bigger answer to that, it seems to me, and it's to draw a contest between, a contrast, I should say, I'm sorry, between the two men that we're talking about here, between Elijah and the king. Because verse 42 spells it out, Ahab went to eat and drink. But Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. <clears throat> Both were at the bottom, it seems, because they had gone down when the prophets were dragged down to be killed. Elijah's mission now 
is going to become the first great theme of this passage. It's going to involve an activity that characterizes him and that ought to characterize every serious follower of our Lord. And the theme is this, that one cannot serve God truly without a life of prayer. So the text's first great lessons come as we watch Elijah do the first of the two things he does in this passage. The text's great lessons at the beginning now come as we watch Elijah pray. It's not wrong to go eat and drink. The Bible is full of feasting. The Bible actually commands the Israelites to attend certain feasts. The scribe Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah later will be reading the law to the Israelites who have long forgotten it. And as he's reading, they weep because they realize how much they haven't done. And he says to them, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. This day is sacred to the Lord. Don't grieve. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He tells them it's appropriate to feast. Jesus made wine at a wedding. Jesus was one who was known that, to come and eat and drink with other people. But Ecclesiastes says, for every season, for everything on earth, there is a time. For everything, there is a season. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. And for Elijah, this was no time for laughter and celebrating. This was a time to pray. Because although the people had given lip service to Jehovah that very afternoon, the great question was, of course, would it last? Would Israel genuinely turn around? Think about it, 400 prophets of Baal have been slaughtered, but 450 prophets of Baal's supposed wife, Asherah, did not come to that event and were still roaming around to pull people away. And then there was Jezebel, who was still very much alive. Now Ahab, the king, had allowed this great contest between Baal and Jehovah, and he had allowed 400 prophets to be slain, but will his heart be changed? Is he going to continue to fly the banner that Elijah hoisted in the honor of Jehovah? And besides, Elijah needs to go pray because there's still no rain. So after the contest, Elijah says to Ahab, I hear the sound of rain and of a drenching storm. He, he believes this through faith, not because of sight. And so as Ahab goes to eat, Elijah climbs the mountain to pray. And now we start to see some of the themes of prayer in this passage that are most helpful to us and challenging. And the first is that prayer in public needs to be fueled by prayer in private. Jesus condemned the Pharisees who stood and prayed great prayers in front of others in order to be thought religious. But he was interested also in the private prayer where you close your closet door, as he said, and pray just to your Father in heaven who sees you in secret and he will reward you openly. <clears throat> now, Elijah had prayed in public that very day. Do you remember? After the prophets of Baal had been unsuccessful, he built the altar of Jehovah. He laid the animal in the wood. He had it drenched in water. And then he said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, hear me, hear me. Let these people know that you are God, that you have sent me, and that you are turning their hearts back to them. It was a moving prayer, as opposed to the gyrations and blood slashing that the prophets of Baal had done. <clears throat> but now, God has to prove himself not only the God of rain, a fire, but the God of rain. James Taylor once sang, I've seen fire, and I've seen rain. Elijah saw fire, but he had not yet seen rain. And this is what he prays for. So he makes the bold pronouncement that it's coming. And so he goes to God in order to call down from heaven in private what he has announced is going to happen in public, that it's going to rain. People who minister particularly as small group leaders, Sunday school teachers, people who, who give talks, uh, pe people who, who give um, lectures in Christian schools, people who preach from a pulpit, people who teach or lead in any way publicly, those who minister in public must pray in private if what they do is really going to get anywhere. So he begins this steep ascent up to the top of this mountain, which leads us to our second principle that we learn from watching him pray. And that is that prayer 
needs to not only precede our spiritual accomplishments, but prayer needs to follow our spiritual accomplishments. And this is not as intuitive to us as Christians. <clears throat> For God's servants in this life, there really is no resting on one's laurels because nothing good that God has ever enabled you to do or has ever done for you, nothing good will go uncontested because the devil is a roaring lion who prowls about seeking whom he will devour. And so after you've come off the highest summit of the greatest spiritual experiences you've ever had, immediately the devil is going to be on you to rob you of all that and to take you in a totally different direction. Do you remember how Jesus Christ himself, after he had fed 5,000, the Bible says he dismissed the crowds and then he went up on a mountainside to pray by himself. When evening came there, Matthew says, he was there alone. We might say that the theme or the principle is that great spiritual accomplishments must be presented to God for his safekeeping. In this case, um, prayer to God for rain. Now, you may have been to some significant ministry. Perhaps you've been on a missions trip and sensed God using you and using the fellows in your team more than you ever dreamed possible. Or maybe you have finally gotten the courage to share the gospel with a friend, an opportunity that you prayed for for a long time. Or maybe you have won a contest with some temptation that dogs at your heels and that you usually flop at. And you just feel, and rightly so, you feel good. You sense the Holy Spirit in you. That is good things. You may have heard a great sermon, but after all these things, you know how quickly you return to everyday life, just normal Monday through Saturday, and God must sustain the gain that you got, or it will be quickly lost. And so Elijah goes back to Carmel, and I suspect the reason he climbs up there, it's not said exactly, but one of the two reasons seems to me, because it often helps to go back to the scene of a great victory. Some of you, years after you're married, may take a trip and go to the scene where the man asked the woman to be his wife. Some of you may go back to your high school field where you did great exploits on the gridiron or you left everyone in the dust racing around that track. Um, I have often walked into the church sanctuary, both this one and the old sanctuary, after an amazing Good Friday service or a Thanksgiving Eve service that has been wonderful or a Christmas Eve service where everybody just sensed the glory of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And after everybody's gone and all the lights are dim, I just walk into that sanctuary and just breathe the air and think to myself, what happened here an hour and a half ago is amazing to me. It's very helpful to my soul. And you probably do that sometimes. I remember one time when I was in high school, there was a man who mentored me and discipled me, and he was an open-air evangelist. I don't mean he stood on the street corner with a sandwich board saying repent or, or burn or something like that. He, it was a lot more classy, but he, he learned he had a sketch board where he would draw very simple drawings that would gather people around, and then over his shoulder he would talk to them slowly about the gospel and weave the gospel into where he was going. And as I got to be a teenager, he asked me to bring my guitar along, and sometimes I'd sing. So we started out with little kids' meetings in, in uh, high-rise projects in poorer sections of Baltimore City or in Chicago. But then later on, we got to where we would go downtown and, and do this with businessmen on the sidewalks f during lunch. Uh, and then the hardest, he said, Steve, next week, let's go to Northern High School during lunch. Northern High School in Baltimore, I'd say, was a probably um, lower middle class, mainly white high school, and fairly rough kids. And during lunch, they were allowed to go outside. And he says, Steve, get your guitar. We pulled up in our van. He opens the side doors, pulls out a little platform to stand on. Jerry rigs a, 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 um, a canopy that f comes over it. It makes a nice little stage. And he says, get up there and sing. So here are all these kids. I was scared to death. But it sang. And as it sang, you felt God with you. Um, the kids did not necessarily feel God with them. So they were booing and yelling, and then you start getting pennies and nickels whizzing by your ears and making nicks in your guitar. And finally, a bunch of them got on either bumper of the truck, and they started rocking the van. It was quite a scene. And then my friend got up, and he preached the gospel. 
And many years later, somehow a letter found its way to ourselves of a, of a young boy saying, I stood at the back of that crowd and watched. He, he said, it was the day I became a Christian. It was remarkable. I remember a few years ago visiting Baltimore, and I was irresistibly drawn to drive back to Northern High School. School was out. Nobody was there. It was a, empty as a box of cornflakes after my sons had gotten a hold of it. Uh, but there we were, and you just remember what God had done there. This is right and good to do. This is what Elijah did, I think, when he went back to the scene of his great victory on Mount Carmel. The idea then is, though, that after a great accomplishment, it needs to be given to God for him to seal up what's been done or it can be lost. Another thing that seems very clear from the story of Elijah here is that uh, our prayers should major on God's agenda, not on ours. This does not mean that we should not pray for things on our own agenda. We, of course, should. God invites us to do this. He says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares about you. And Jesus included in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. You're praying about everyday things you need to. This is right and good. And Elijah is going to do that in the next chapter. But the majority of prayer, as our Lord teaches and as this passage teaches, is should be given to God's agenda. Jesus said, here's how you open your prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. And you will find yourself, as you find yourself training yourself to pray for the things that God is interested in primarily, for his kingdom to spread, his glory to be had, his gospel to succeed in people's lives and whatnot, you will sense his pleasure and his spirit enabling you to pray. So here is Elijah praying God's agenda. What is he doing? What is he praying? The text doesn't say exactly what he prays, but we can pretty well guess. First, it seems to me he's humbling himself before the Lord. He knows he is just a weak man. James says that Elijah was a man of similar passions to us, and yet he prayed, and the Lord honored him regarding this rain. And beside then humbling himself before the Lord, doubtless, he's saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you just did. Do you think what would happen if Elijah prayed to God and he had not sent that fire? 400 prophets would be dragging him to the bottom of Carmel and slaughtering him and slitting his throat by the Kishon River. But instead, God showed himself marvelous. And then having thanked God and having, having acknowledged his own weakness, doubtless he again, as he has doubtless done hundreds of times, he confesses the sins of his nation to his father. Father, we have, we have wandered from you. Lord, we have broken your commandments. Lord, we have worshiped Baal. He doubtless uses the weed like all the other prophets do when they pray in the Bible because he identifies with these people and he begs God's mercy. He is like Jesus Christ interceding for his people as Jesus is doing for us this very day. And so much of our prayer should be the same, where we are praying for other people and our nation and our neighbors for God to have mercy on them and praying God's agenda. And doubtless, doubtless, Elijah is reminding God in his prayer of God's own promises. God had told him in verse 1, you go to Ahab and tell him, I am going to send rain on the land. Now, because God has promised this, we might say, why would Elijah pray it? God says, I'm going to send rain. Great. Lord, I'm going to take a front row seat and watch you do it. Let's see it. But he doesn't. Elijah prays for God to do what God said he would do. This is a pattern all through the Bible. God has given his promises not for our presumption. He's given our promises for our prayers. He really has. The idea, the general principle is this. God tells us in the Bible things that he is committed to do. And then he asks us to pray that he will do those very things. It might seem redundant, but it's not. And as you spend more and more years praying in this manner for God to do what he has promised to do, you will sense, God will give you a spirit to sense that that pleases him. And there's some of the best prayers you'll ever pray is to pray God's words back to him that he has already said. 
You may recall how, how God teaches this in the books of Jeremiah and Daniel. Jeremiah the prophet, who lived during the exile of Judah um, under the Babylonians, carried away hundreds of miles in Jerusalem, leveled. God had revealed to Jeremiah that this whole country, this is Jeremiah 25, 11, will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years, but now in Jeremiah 29, 10, God said, when 70 years are completed, I will come to you and fulfill my promise to bring you back to this place, Jerusalem. Now, many decades later, in Persia, in exile, the prophet Daniel is reading the Bible, and he comes to Jeremiah 25 and 29, and he reads that God has promised after 70 years he would bring the Israelites back from Persia. And so Daniel says in chapter 9, I understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord, to the prophet Jeremiah, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. And now Jer I mean, uh, Daniel spends the whole chapter 9 praying that God would indeed send Israel back because the 70 years are drawing near. So God tells us to pray his promises back to him. Another thing we learn about prayer from watching Jeremiah, I mean, uh, Elijah do it, I guess we learn from Jeremiah too, is that prayer ought to be in earnest. I don't mean that we should never just pray quick prayers really quickly. You're in the, uh, you're in the seat of your car and another car pulls in front of you, God help me, God help me. That's fine. Or if you even pray lightly, God, Lord, if, if you would give us a rain-free day on our vacation, we would love that. Thank you. That's okay. But earnest prayer is, is mainly what God is looking for. And here, the way that Elijah shows his earnest prayer is the same way that he showed it when he was with the widow and her son, and the son died, and he stretched his body out over the boy. Elijah shows the earnestness of his prayer by the posture of his body. Now, I don't know exactly how it looked. Um, there's no biblical command, by the way, to always pray in a certain way. Prayer in the Bible is done by standing, by kneeling, by prostrating a person's self, by raising a person's hand. Uh, we read that, that, that Jacob prayed to sitting on his bed, leaning on his staff, this kind of thing. But the biblical examples show that God is pleased when in our earnestness, we use our bodies in some way to show the intent of our heart and the seriousness with which we're approaching the throne of God. The earnestness of, of uh, Elijah was shown not just in his bodily posture, because it says that he bowed down and put his face between his knees. It says that his earnestness was shown in his perseverance. Now, recall the geography we talked about last week. Here you have this 12-mile mountain range. At one place, there is an area, probably the only place in the entire mountain that could accommodate um, several thousand people on a plateau quite high up near the very summit, but not at the very summit. It takes a short walk up a further summit to get to the bald top, and only from there can you see the Mediterranean Sea to the west. So Elijah is, we might say, 98% up the mountain. He's praying to God, and he wonders, has God answered? So he says to his servant boy, go up and look. The boy scrambles up the bald hill, strains his eyes out toward the Mediterranean. Elijah's not going to like this. Comes back, nothing. Pray some more. Go again and pray some more. Can you imagine during that seven times? On the sixth time, I would be so nervous if I was that man. But God has said, I will send rain. And God has filled his Bible with promises that are the equivalent of I will send rain that he's told to us. And so Elijah keeps at it until God answers. You remember that Jesus talked about that same kind of perseverance in prayer. In Luke chapter 18, we read, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should Always pray and not give up. He's talking about that family member of yours that still resists Jesus Christ. 
He's talking about that physical pain that someone you love endures that will not go away. He's talking about a nation that seems to be slipping into the abyss about ready to go off the cliff and doesn't seem to want to turn around. He's talking about the things that we should pray for, and he says, don't stop. Israel, you will recall, means he wrestles with God because Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, wrestled with the angel that night, and he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. This is what Elijah did. And I would suggest that, that part of Elijah's perseverance is shown in how he reacted to the report of a tiny cloud in the horizon on the seventh viewing, the size, it says, of a man's hand. Picture this, way in the distance, this little cloud, what is that going to do? Elijah knew what it was going to do. Elijah knew this was an enormous front coming in so very far away. But it was small as a man's hand. And, and so um, we read that the great Matthew Henry wrote, I said wisely and rightly, I think, that great blessings often arise from small beginnings. It, it seems to me pictorial of how we truly ought to take small answers to prayer as, as tokens or, or precursors to greater ones. You pray and you get small answers and you may be tempted to despise them. But in the Old Testament, when the Temple of Jerusalem was leveled by enemies, and when they were all taken into exile, and then the Jews were allowed to come back 70 years later, and they started to build the temple, the Old Testament records that the new temple that they built was so much smaller that many of them wept who remembered the old building. It seems like no big deal. This is the fulfillment of God's promise, this small temple. They did not realize, of course, that the temple that God meant would eventually be rebuilt was the temple of Jesus' body who would walk in the temple of Herod, and it would be more grand than anything that Solomon had ever built. But this little small temple that was there to honor God again, God says, don't despise the day of small things. He said that in the prophets. And so he asked us not to despise the day of small answers to prayer as well. When I think of um, a small cloud the size of a man's hand as an answer to prayer, I sometimes think about the children in our church. It seems to me as I watch all these kids being raised by you parents who are taking it so seriously that they're like little clouds, small as a man's hand. And by God's grace, this generation of kids is going to grow up and the storm of rain and life that is going to drench this world from those people is all out of proportion to what it looks like they will accomplish here today. God asks you to take the small answers and in faith believe they will become large. Now, if all the great lessons that we've looked at come from watching Elijah pray, very briefly, we look at the second and last way that we learn from this passage, and that is from watching Elijah run. As soon as he learned the cloud from his boy, he sent word down to Ahab on the ground and said, hitch your chariot, go home before the rain stops you. The idea is this rain, after three and a half years of not a drop, is going to be so drenching that the roads are going to turn so muddy and there are going to be so many torrents overwhelming them that you'll never make it home if you don't start right now. And so Ahab does what he's told and the sky is darkened and the wind begins to stir gently at first and then a little more fiercely and then just gloriously violently and then a great deluge, this driving rain, these torrents of water come down. You can picture what this is like. Ahab is just spurring the horses on to race home before the roads become uncrossable. Imagine the joy of that nation's face. Imagine the joy on his face. Sometimes you don't like to be caught in a rain, but sometimes you just love it. And these people had to be, uh, to me, they're like seeing Florida residents that I saw in college who had never seen snow, and they're out there, and finally it snows, and they run outside of the classroom in the dormitories, and they're just like this, having never seen it. These people are like little kids to feel rain on their face, to feel water all over their bodies, whooping and screaming and laughing, and doubtless Ahab feels the same. 
This rain, of course, was the first great grace that God showed Ahab on that day. But an even greater grace, it seems to me, is what God showed to Ahab when we read that Elijah ran with Ahab. We read that he not only ran with him, we read that he ran in front of him. Here is the idea behind this. And here, I, I, of all the people I've read and all the thinking I've done on my own, I, I, I can't think of anything to match what Dale Ralph Davis and Kyle and Dalich have written about this. So I'm gonna draw from them pretty heavily here. See what you think. My, my, my proposition to you is that Elijah running with Ahab is an even greater grace than the rain that God sent. Think of who Ahab is. Ahab had opened the door of the castle to the enemy by marrying Jezebel and allowing her foreign religion to come. Not only that, he had established her religion as the state religion in Israel and bumped off a center stage the worship of Jehovah. He had approved the construction plans for the uh, building of Baal's altar and for the building of Baal's temple. He had himself, we read, bowed down to Baal and served him. And Davis calls him the gutless wonder who allowed his wife Jezebel to butcher Jehovah's prophets and allowed her men to pull down Jehovah's altars. This was the man who had commanded an international manhunt for Elijah to bring him down in all the countries that he could reach. And he was the man, this was the man who said to Elijah, you, sir, are the troubler of Israel. And the word troubler is probably not a strong enough translation. It, it, it has the idea of you are the person who is on the dark side and bringing darkness to our nation. This was the man to whom God sent rain, and that rain was a grace, but now the second grace. We read, the power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Jezreel, that is, where the palace awaits and where Queen Jezebel awaits her husband. Now, our attention probably focuses on the athletic feat of this. Jezreel is some 17 miles away from where the incident at Carmel took place. Now, I realize a few of you may be tempted to say, well, big deal, I ran 26.2. Okay, maybe you did. But Elijah did it while keeping ahead of Ahab's chariot horses the entire time. He had to be supernaturally empowered by the Lord to do it. And the fact that God supernaturally empowered him to do it makes it clear that God has a definite message he wants to send by Elijah's running. What is that message? Well, it seems to me that while we tend to focus just on the word ran, that the focus of the text is on the word ahead. The text emphasizes that Elijah ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. I have read person after person, writer after writer say that this is symbolic of Elijah being like a herald in front of King Ahab. I'm sorry, I can have none of it. That seems ridiculous to me. What seems to me and it seems to some others that I think is a far deeper significance is this. Up till now, Elijah had shown himself to be only a stern prophet. But now, Elijah shows himself to be Ahab's faithful subject and faithful servant. Elijah doesn't go his own way after the process. There you go, Ahab catch you later. What are you going to do about it? No, no, no. Elijah goes with him to the summer palace of the king. He goes with the king. And this is meant to touch the king's heart. Ahab is meant to see this man is going to be right with me. He is sent by God to run this way in order to keep Ahab from Baal, to remind Ahab of what happened 17 miles earlier to get Ahab understanding that God's grace is reaching out to him, that God is seeking to break the resistance of this rebellious man. As Kylan Dalitz put it, Elijah is running to show that Elijah is not trying to ruin him, but is here to save the man's soul. And 
he is trying to increase the impression that Carmel made upon the king and to strengthen him against the temptations he's going to face when he gets home and sees Jezebel. And now, from Davis, Davis says, and yet, despite all that Ahab had done in the list we just gave, now God offers this swine a gospel opportunity by showing him the royal road to repentance. Follow Elijah and his God. God is offering him the help of his prophet. Now, we may think about Ahab and say, why would God be so gracious to a man who had done so much damage to the kingdom of God? But when you stop and think about the damage that you and that I have done to the kingdom of God by our sins, both secret and known, by our stiff-neckedness, by our rebelliousness, by our failure to rouse ourselves so many times, who can dare object that God would show Ahab grace? <laughs> Davis says, the grace that God's shown is incredible. But when you come to think of it, there really isn't any other kind of grace but incredible. And here's the idea now. The idea is that Elijah runs ahead of Ahab because God is saying, Ahab, the king, and Elijah, the prophet, should work together to the reformation of God's people that have drifted so far from him that the king could now, if he wanted it, have Elijah as his willing servant rather than as some fist-shaking enemy. The prophet wants to be with the king. Actually, God expresses it a little differently in how he makes it happen. The prophet is going in front of the king. And that's the proper relationship. God's prophet giving God's word and the secular ruler following him and together with the Bible and with the might of the state, turning these people around in a godly direction. And here's a man named Vant Veer, a, a Dutch scholar, who puts it this way. This, that is, the king following the prophet, is the exact relationship that Yahweh wanted at that moment. The king on his way to his residence and throne, preceded by the bearer of the word of God. In other words, God, amazingly, for the second time that day, once with the rain, once with the running prophet, shows that he has not rejected Ahab yet. This is astounding. And perhaps there are those of you in this room who think, I have crossed the line, I have gone too far, I am irredeemable. Many years ago, our church had a discipline case before we even have a building. It was by a young woman who had gone to high school with several of the women in our church and had eventually become a Christian during high school years and later on came to attend this church. Later on, we needed to have a service of church discipline. It was our first, I believe, and it was one of the hardest things we ever did is to excommunicate this girl whom we all loved and whom several of our members had watched become a Christian years ago in 11th or 12th grade, let's say. <clears throat> After we had an excommunication, this particular girl, of course, she left, and we just did not see her. For seven years, we did not see her. And then one night, I remember telephone ringing, I picked it up. Hi, Steve, this is, I'll just use the name, Sally. Hi, how you doing? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm remarried now. Could my husband and I come and talk to you and Verna? Yeah, and so she did. And as she came, she told us. And please forgive me, I can't remember if I've told this story to the majority of you or not, but it's so appropriate here. When she came, she told us that after she left and was excommunicated by our church, she just hit the skids spiritually and just got into everything imaginable. She started running around with a guy who was a, a drug dealer. He slept with a gun under his pillow and, and he was a bad news person and they were bad news together. And then they went to a little chapel. They only did it because they had a friend who kept bugging them about coming to church, coming to church to get him off their backs. 
She came, and her husband came. They sat in the back row. It was a little King James-only, Bible-banging, hellfire-breathing sermon. The last kind of thing you think would draw a person like that. She said, and what happened was, as the pastor said, I'm going to invite anybody who wants to become a Christian to walk down the aisle. She said to her amazement, her husband stood up and shot down that aisle. She couldn't believe it. She, she knew he had no idea that she had ever been inside of a church. She had no idea that... that that he had no idea that she even knew what a Christian was. He was converted that day. And so slowly, as he began to grow under the tutelage of this pastor, they together embraced Sally, and she began to turn around. She told us that night that she had thought she was guilty of the unpardonable sin and could never be received back by God again. Has anyone here done worse than the murderous, nation-ruining Ahab. God has not rejected this man yet, and he has not rejected you while you still have breath. And so, here's how Davis closes his treatment of this passage that is so fascinating. Imagine that crucial, fleeting scene. Elijah, they reach Jezreel, 17 miles away, Elijah stops, bent one quarter over, heaving for oxygen. Momentarily, Ahab's chariot comes barreling past and turns down the lane leading to his summer residence. Elijah and Ahab can both see it. There's a light on in the palace in the queen's quarters. Ahab has an offer of grace in his hand, but his feet will soon stand in the devil's bedroom. How will Ahab respond to the grace he has been shown? How will you respond to the grace you have been shown? Pray about these matters if you would. Our Lord Jesus, telling the parable of the prodigal son who wasted his father's money, spent it all on, on riotous living, eventually was poor and hungry, and came home to ask his father to let him be one of the servants. Jesus said that the father looked up and saw his son from a distance, and he ran to him and threw his arms around him and kissed them and said, bring the finest robes and kill the fatted calf, for this my son was lost, and now he is found. God, if any prodigal son or daughter is sitting in this room, please give them the faith to believe that you, the Father, are waiting for them to come, that you would welcome them, that their repentance will be met with arms around them, and that their faith will be met with pardon and forgiveness and welcome to the family. Please do that, Lord, for those who have never been yours and any who have drifted far from you. And now, may the grace of our Lord, who sent fire and rain and caused Elijah to run, may that same grace be yours in abundance 
and may God give you the faith to see it and believe it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you.